It's Monday, May 30. In the headlines, plans for a new housing development in Denham Town. Update on a cruise ship crash in Falmouth. Regionally, Tobago public servants to protest government's 2% wage increase. And in sports, sprint star Elaine thompson Hera sprints to a victory in a season's best time. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. Plans are being made to build a new housing development dubbed Victoria Villa with 35 units in Denhamtown, Kingston. Prime Minister Andrew Holness made the announcement on the weekend. The apartment complex will be constructed adjacent to St. Albans Primary School. We're going to be doing 35 units there. We're going to be breaking ground for Rasta City in short order. The, the contracts have been issued, well, have been tendered, uh, and hopefully that process can be completed quickly so we can start the development for Rasta City. Mr. Holness said funds have been identified to commence the upgrading of Board Villa, another community in the area. The Prime Minister, who is delivering a tribute to the late Honorable Edward Siaga, noted that the housing developments are in keeping with Mr. Siaga's vision for the constituency that he served as a Member of Parliament from 1962 until his retirement in 2005. His vision was to uplift the community by improving housing and other civil infrastructure, but to also improve quality of life by improving the social infrastructure, schools, nurseries, and community centers, health centers, parks, and markets. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister said Mr. Siaga was concerned about the level of violence that impacted the constituency. Above everything else, what he wanted was a community of peace. He wanted the people of West Kingston to be able to live in peace. Denham Town is currently the site of a zone of special operations, an anti-crime measure that includes intervention from the state's social services. Mr. Siaga, who died at age 89 on May 28, 2019, had the distinction of being the longest serving member of parliament in the history of Jamaica and the Caribbean region during his tenure. The area reserved at National Heroes Park in downtown Kingston for interring Jamaicans who made outstanding contributions to the country is to receive a facelift. That's the word from Prime Minister Andrew Holness. He was addressing a floral tribute ceremony at the facility on Saturday to commemorate the 92nd anniversary of the birth of Jamaica's fifth Prime Minister, Edward Siaga. Jamaica is not expected to bear the cost of the repairs to the Falmouth Pier following Thursday's damage to the structure caused by one of Royal Caribbean International's cruise ships. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says he expects that discussions will take place between the Port Authority of Jamaica and the cruise line regarding repairs to the pier. The tourism minister in a statement explains that, quote, it's not going to be something that will be of any significant impact, and we hope for sure that it will not set us back in any way, end quote. He furthers, quote, the cruise lines and ourselves have a great relationship, as you know, and we have no doubt that the arrangements will make sure that full recovery and reparation is done, end quote. Harmony of the Seas, which is the third largest ship in the world, also sustained damage while docking at the pier. Royal Caribbean said none of the 7,000 passengers or crew was injured. Inspections showed the overall damage to be minor and the ship was repaired. 
Director of the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne, says the deficit in health workforce in the Americas reaches 600,000 professionals, something that affects access to care, especially for those in rural and underserved areas of the region. She shared the information during the deliberations of the 2022 to 2030 Action Plan, Working for Health, at the 75th World Health Assembly last week. How are you working with your education systems to make sure that you have primary care physicians that understand the community, that you have nurses and other categories of healthcare workers around primary health care? If you're not doing that, we're not here then. The PAHO director notes that during the peaks of the pandemic, task shifting and task sharing saved lives, and that patient care delivery was facilitated by digital transformation. She explained that with that aim, PAHO, through its virtual campus for public health, trained more than 900,000 health workers in the control and management of COVID-19, health services continuity, and vaccine deployment during the pandemic. There must be increased investments in health. Where's the 15% of in the Abuja declaration? In, in, in PAHO, um, PAHO 6% of GDP. And how is that money being investment being divided for primary health care? In the Americas, we passed a 30-30-30 declaration that 30% of the public resources available from health for health must go to primary health care, and that 30% of those barriers must be removed by 2030. Unless there is significant investments going to primary health care, we are not going to make it. Unless we have financing mechanisms that will ensure that people have access to care free of payment at point of service, we will never get there. Among the effects of COVID-19, a World Health Organization study estimated that around 115,000 health workers died between January 2020 and May 2021 worldwide. Dr. Etienne says investing in health systems and a fit-for-purpose health workforce constitutes a priority for the Americas. There needs to be really an investment in essential public health functions. And, and I heard the minister from Jamaica, because their primary health care was so engaged in detecting, reporting, and responding to COVID-19, they were better able to, um, to respond at that level. And where is the investment in equipment and supplies? We talk about quality of care. You can't have quality of care unless you have the tools to work with. Time now for your regular market updates from Danita Rodney in the Business Report. Boosting innovation, growth, and entrepreneurship ecosystems, Biggie, is a program geared towards promoting innovation and productivity among macro small businesses in Jamaica. Minister of Finance Dr. Nigel Clark stated that the Biggie program has been instrumental in reforming the business ecosystem. As important as other forms of businesses are, businesses that are not involved in innovation, they take one thing and they make it available somewhere else. That's important. But for us to have the kind of economic growth to, that can support the kind of jobs, we need value-added private sector activity, which is all based on innovation. And hence, the naming of the program, Boosting Innovation and Growth in Entrepreneurial Ecosystems. And the name itself is an important recognition that making one business flourish or 10 businesses flourish or 50 businesses flourish is not sufficient. What we have to do is to reform an entire ecosystem and address an ecosystem in its entirety. And that is what the Biggie program is geared to doing, to addressing the innovation ecosystem and putting innovation at the center of business. He says the program is a sign of the government's commitment to promoting innovation and more. This program underscores the government's commitment to promoting, financing, and investing 
in innovation. Dr. Clark says the grants provided through the program is an inspiration for innovation in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Now, when you put a grant fund like that and you make it available, what does it do? It spurs innovation. It spurs businesses to think in a different way, to move the frontiers forward. And it supports confidence that here in Jamaica, we can innovate too. Innovation is not only a property of North America and Asia and Europe. We can innovate right here in Jamaica and right here in the Caribbean. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Friday, May 27, the US dollar sold for an average of $154.89. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $122.22. The pound sterling traded for $196.58. And the euro sold for an average of $166.20. The following reflects the movement of the JSE indices in Friday's trading session. The JSE index advanced by 678 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 15 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 777 points to close at over 300,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 1,636 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 98 stocks of which 45 advanced, 42 declined, and 11 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited, 1834 Investments Limited, and Bridge Pains Jamaica Limited. Stocks declined for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited Verba Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share, and JMMB Group 5.75% Preferred Shares. The following companies represent the overall volume leaders. Trans Jamaican Highway Limited and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units, and QWI Investments Limited with over 900,000 units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Macro Index Fund was the volume leader with 30 shares, followed by Clico Investment Fund with 3 shares being traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Government of Barbados Bond Series B was the volume leader with over 400,000 shares. They were followed by Goddard Enterprises Limited with over 10,000 shares and Epley Caribbean Property Fund Value Fund with 2,300 shares. In regional business, as the world continues to deal with inflation and supply chain disruptions, one important piece of the conversation is often overlooked. CBC Barbados's Anne-Marie Bailey takes a look at these and the impact the rising cost of fuel has on the local economy. Even if you've never bought a gallon of diesel in your life, high diesel prices can hit your wallet and the economy in multiple ways. Diesel is described as the fuel that powers economies and it's in short supply. Andy Armstrong, director of Armstrong Agencies Limited, local distributors for a variety of goods, says he has seen the impact on the local economy. Freight and companies who move cargo from the port to our warehouses, they have increased their rates this year. Energy economists worry the short supply of the fuel will further spike the cost per liter, which earlier this month hit an all-time high of Barbados, $4.03 per liter on the local market. Soaring diesel prices have also been linked to record high rates of inflation across the globe. Where you get a bigger impact, though, is when the cost of freight on certain things goes up to the people who supply us, and then they raise their first cost to us. And certainly we've seen that a lot this year, the price of cereal, the price of paper products, the price of cooking oil has gone through the roof, the price of soap, and a lot of soap is derived from oil. So those kind of items have really gone through the roof. Retailers used to really push back on us, but they, they know the situation because some of them import stuff directly, so they understand that prices are going up. Um, as an end consumer, yeah, it's certainly painful because we as end consumers are the ones who ultimately pay the price. 
While the rising cost of goods and the rising cost of diesel are linked, the spin-off effects permeate the local economy. One local catamaran cruise company recently raised their prices due in part to the rising cost of diesel. Nick Parker, co-owner of Silver Moon's Catamaran Cruises, explains the impact on the tourism sector. We do provide transportation for the majority of our visiting customers, and most of that um, is provided by subcontracted operators. You know. We've had to give them an increase. The increased cost of diesel have infected us directly, and then of course there are the indirect um, increases in cost, such as foodstuffs and general supplies, you know, because everything, as, as we all know, everything is going up every, almost every week it seems prices are changing. Record high diesel prices have not translated to rationing, and the hope is a downward trend in pricing is on the horizon. Anne-Marie Bailey, CBC News. In market data for oil, oil prices climbed this morning as traders waited to see whether the European Union would reach an agreement on banning Russian oil imports. Brent crude was up 69 cents or 0.6 percent at $120.12 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate crude jumped 74 cents or 0.6 percent to $115.81 a barrel. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, public servants in Tobago who are against the government's 2% wage offer will express their dissatisfaction as of early this week. Public Services Association Industrial Relations Officer for the Tobago region, Hayden Duke, said the plight of workers in Trinidad is the same for workers in Tobago. Is totally disgusted. We feel totally disrespected. And as such, it being one PSA, the members in Tobago will operate in no wise different from our colleagues in Trinidad. As early as 6 p.m. tomorrow, public servants will take the necessary action to show their disgust for what they have been given as an offer by the government of the day and the CPO. On Friday, hundreds of workers led by the heads of their respective unions took to the streets of Port of Spain to demand that the Chief Personnel Officer, Dr. Daryl Dindial, revisit his counter-proposal of 2% for the period 2014 to 2021. Tobago has close to 4,000 public servants employed with the Tobago House of Assembly. Minister with Responsibility for Transport and Urban Development in St. Kitts and Nevis, Wendy Phipps, has given more information regarding the reshuffling of the boards of the Urban Development Corporation and the St. Christopher Air and Seaport Authority. Minister Phipps said following a review of the performance of both boards, she found irregular hiring practices and salaries at SCASPA. It came to my attention rather that some 62 persons were hired between January 2022 and May 2022. My concern was further heightened by the fact that a number of persons who are newly hired were being paid significantly more than other employees who had been hired between four to ten years prior to do virtually the same jobs. What has exacerbated this situation is that in spite of my written and oral directive to place a freeze on hiring, five additional hires were done, with a number of them being paid at this exorbitant rate. She said these new hires were financially impractical. The net effect of this situation is that these 67 new hires create extra payroll burden to SCASPA of almost $2 million per year. This unfortunate situation comes at a time when SCASPA is illiquid and is unable to cover its expenses. In fact, the Ministry of Finance has confirmed that between September 2020 to December 2021, it has rendered financial assistance to SCASPA to the tune of $17,287,767. And when it comes to the Urban Development Corporation, one area of concern focused on the credit cards that were issued to senior officials. Corporate credit cards were issued to both the chairman and the chief executive officer. 
the credit limit on the card issued to the chairman is $26,250, while the one issued to the CEO carries a limit of $48,750. The minutes further state that the cards, quote, are to be used to make purchases on behalf of the corporation, unquote. It is clear, it is unclear rather, what levels of control have been exercised over these expenditure that will be covered by the credit cards. It is also rather irregular for corporate purchases to be routinely paid by credit card. Progress is being made in the construction of a border fence between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. This according to Minister of Defense, Lieutenant General Carlos Luciano Diaz Marfa, who has been supervising the progress of the work being done. Following a recent tour of the site, Diaz Marfa says, quote, the fence will benefit both countries because it will allow more efficiency in the control of the migratory flow in the fight against cattle theft and other illicit activities such as drug trafficking, the illegal sale of arms, and the protection of agricultural producers, strengthening the current protection schemes of the border area." End quote. Construction earlier this year started on the concrete barrier that will span nearly half of the 244-mile border between the two countries that share the island of Hispaniola. AgroFest 2022 has been officially opened in Barbados with renewed optimism about the Caribbean's ability to feed itself. While the soaring cost of food has given this event even greater significance, the involvement of other Caribbean nations has further bolstered the excitement and heightened expectations about finding realistic solutions to fend off the impending crisis. Guyana's President Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali delivered the feature address. When there is a shortage of supply, we are not the top priority for the demand that exists. That is why we have to fix this, and we have to fix it as a collective. We have to understand that the challenges that will come will impact us the most. And our only tool to mitigate those challenges is increasing our own production, removing sometimes the thoughtless impediments to trading between ourselves. The St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies is set to return to face-to-face -face learning this September. Campus Principal Brian Copeland announced that members of staff will return to campus from June 6th. The move comes after the Trinidadian government mandated all tertiary institutions to implement strategies to return to in-person learning. The campus suspended in-person learning in March 2020. Campus Principal Copeland thanked the few members of staff who remained on site to ensure premises remained safe and operational. Meanwhile, the campus guild's president, Kobe Sandy, believes the hybrid format should be retained to cater to students who are employed or overseas and expressed his wish for any official communication on the return to in-person learning to be timely. In Antigua and Barbuda, Prime Minister Gaston Brown is encouraging the population to be vigilant and get vaccinated as the number of COVID-19 cases increases. More from ABS News. The probability of contracting COVID at this time is perhaps far greater uh, than at any time during the last um, what, two and a half years uh, since um, COVID first featured. He assures vaccination is the best option as some uh, people's immune systems may be compromised. So even if you're healthy, you may not um, respond um, you know, the way you would expect to COVID. I mean, there are many healthy people who have been taken down and taken out by COVID. The nation's leader says he looks forward to receiving his second booster next month.
In sports, Olympic sprint double champion Elaine thompson Hera and fellow Olympic champion Shelly Ann Fraser-Price turned in impressive season's best performances at the Eugene Diamond League meet in Oregon, United States on Saturday. thompson Hera took the 100 meters in 10.79 seconds, while Fraser-Price landed the 200 meters in 22.41 seconds. The two were the only Jamaican winners on the day. Here are the races. Speaking after her 100-meter race, Elaine thompson Hera defended her rival, Shakari Richardson. She's a good athlete, and I think she's taking her way back on the track. And I think you guys just give her some breathe and let her breathe and come and try and perform. When asked about her performance, Shelly Ann had this to say. Um, I'm feeling good. You know, a win is always good. Uh, in terms of execution, I'm not sure if I executed it the way I wanted to. But then I definitely have, I think, one more 200 to go to get that together. Shelly Ann says that it's good to have strong competition in the 100 and 200 meter women's races. She also has her eyes set on the 100 meter world record. I've always believed that for me to talk about the world record, I would have to be running 10.6. And I've run 10.60 last year, and I'm definitely looking forward to going faster this year. So if I'm able to get down to 10.5, then I definitely think that with a perfect race and perfect execution and having, you know, very good competition, definitely think it's possible. The West Indies are currently in the Netherlands preparing to take on the home team in three one-day internationals to gain some valuable points in the ICC Men's World Cup Super League tournament. Vice Captain Shea Hope says that even though the conditions are new to them, the squad intends on playing each game on merit. I'm a strong believer in playing this situation. So I wouldn't say that we have to play one particular way um, in, in any particular inning. So. Um, it's about assessing the conditions quickly, seeing what the opposition are throwing at you, first of all, and then finding the best way to score runs, because we all know whoever scores the most runs in the cricket game wins. So it's about trying to find the best plan and what would work on that particular day, because every day something can be different. The, the conditions can be different. So it's just about adapting quickly and finding the best way to go about scoring runs. Their first game bowls off on May 31 at 4 a.m. Jamaica time. And that's the news on PBC Jamaica. Remember to follow us on all social media pages at PBC Jamaica. Thank you for watching.